Rise of Totalitarian Islam by Yaron Brook. Good morning, everybody. So this is the um, this is the masochistic class, where you come at eight thirty to hear really depressing stuff <laughs> about a region of the world you'd rather not know about. Um, so uh, we'll try to make this as interesting and as fun as possible, but it's going to be tough. Uh, it's it's a depressing topic. Um, I want to make this as, uh, you know, uh, as open as possible. Feel free to raise your hand, ask questions uh, for the purposes of uh, taping. Uh, I'll try to repeat the questions. If I forget, somebody remind me. Um, we're trying to get this on tape. So uh, feel free at any point in time, if there are any questions or anything comes up, uh, raise your hand and ask. Um, let me also give the uh, disclaimers up front. Um, I don't consider this the definitive uh, statement on the rise of totalitarian Islam. I, I am not a professional historian. I, you know, Dr. McCaskey's here, so I have to, uh, I don't read original sources in Arabic, don't know the language. Um, my, my views on uh, the rise of totalitarian Islam as of, uh, what are we, uh, 1st of July, uh, 2006. Um, there's a lot of material here. Uh, we'll see how uh, how we get through it. Does everybody have an outline? Great. Um, I will try to get you, uh, in the next couple of days, I'll actually get you a timeline uh, of a lot of the stuff that we'll be covering, um, just to give you a sense of the of the period and something you walk away with, with a, with a kind of historical timeline. Okay. After September 11th, there was a lot of talk about why this happened, what happened, and who, who attacked us. Um, I think there was a lot of confusion uh, among Americans who, for them, this was the first encounter with such a thing as this kind of suicidal terrorism, uh, this kind of terrorism where thousands of people uh, died and where the terrorists didn't seem to care about their own lives, just blow themselves up. You can see it on the news in Israel or in uh, Pakistan or in other countries, but it's remote. But when those two Twin Towers fell, it became very, very real for Americans. It became very, very real for us. And the immediate question was, who and why? And I believe that one of the most um, crucial, deadly uh, misidentifications, historical misidentifications, was the identification of the who with terrorism, rather than with the ideology driving those particular specific terrorists. It was like identifying uh, the uh, enemy in World War II after Pearl Harbor is kamikaze pilots, kamikaze fighters, rather than Japanese imperialism and going all out war with Japan. And the consequence, in my view, have been horrific for the so called war on terrorism. Because if you don't know who you're fighting, you don't fight the right battles, you don't identify the right enemies. Okay. So, one of the things we're going to be doing here is talking about who that enemy is. What are the historical roots? Where do they come from? Where are they heading? What are their goals? How have they evolved? Um, one of the reasons this course is called The Rise without the decline of Islamic terrorism, because after September 11th, you would have expected a decline after the US response, is a consequence of that misidentification. And, and I just want to give you a quick survey of the way I look at the state of the world you know, outside of the United States today, just to give you a sense of the rise of Islamic totalitarianism and where they are, they are today in the political map. Uh, it's not obviously just September 11th. Uh, we've seen terrorist attacks in London. Uh, we've seen terrorist attacks in Madrid. London, I think uh, the one year will be one year in a few, July 7th, so while we're still here at the conference. Uh, Madrid was just a couple of years ago. Danish cartoons, 
the response in the Muslim world to those Danish cartoons, the burning of embassies, the killing of people, as a response to cartoons. Um, if you've been following the news, you know, for example, that Somalia, uh, which for years has been in a state of anarchy, is now power is being consolidated. Who is it being consolidated by? It's being consolidated by what they're calling the Islamic courts. Uh, this is another form of the same elements, the same group. You know, they want to impose the same thing as Osama bin Laden wants to impose. Sharia, Islamic law on Somalia. You know, and if you read their literature, that's just the beginning. You know, Somalia will be the first in many places that they will go from there. So Somalia seems to be have gone from a state of anarchy, U.S. involvement a long time ago, to today a state in which um, Islamic law is being imposed. The Hamas victory in the Palestinian Authority. Here is another movement dedicated ultimately to imposing Islamic law to begin with on the Palestinian Authority, ultimately on the entire area that is today Israel, and ultimately beyond that, the entire Middle East and the world beyond. Iraq, who won the Iraqi elections? Well, the winner of the Iraqi elections, the, the group that headed the Shiite coalition that won the Iraqi election is called Skiri, the Supreme Council for an Islamic revolution in Iraq. That is the political party that won election. Again, dedicated. Now, you know, they have to play their politics carefully because ultimately they're being occupied by American forces. But if you read their literature, ultimately dedicated to the establishment of Islamic law in Iraq. Shiites, in this case, versus Sunnis in Somalia, and we'll get to the differences between the two uh, later on in the class. But the same dedication, Islamic law all over Iraq. And it's in their constitution. The opening to do that is already in the Iraqi constitution, even under an American occupation. You know, when you don't identify the enemy, you don't know what to look for in terms of signs of where that enemy really is. Look at Iran, a country dedicated, obviously, to Islamic law, to Sharia, to, to this Islamic totalitarianism. They are more, they feel, at least, more powerful than ever, stronger than ever, snubbing the West, pursuing nuclear program, increasing influence in the Middle East. They just signed a uh, joint defense deal with the uh, Syrian government, where, which includes the positioning of, Iraq, of Iranian troops uh, opposite the Israeli troops on the Golan Heights. So increasing influence. Um, Lebanon. Uh, the Hezbollah, which is a, uh, again, Islamic totalitarian movement aligned with Iran. Just won more seats in the Lebanese parliament as a result of the latest election than in any other time, any other election. And actually, for the first time in Lebanese history, is actually has a seat in the cabinet, in the government of Lebanon. Uh, and then, of course, you read every day what's going on in Afghanistan, uh, the rise, the, the, the resurgence of the Taliban, thousands of them, um, and the, you know, the, the, the uncertainty, the increasing uncertainty around uh, the, the Afghan president. But even in Afghanistan, think about the regime we have in place. Think about that case just a few weeks ago uh, with the Muslim who converted to Christianity, and they were going to hang him. They were going to kill this guy. And it's only enormous pressure, international pressure, that got him. You know, kind of they said, well, he's insane, he needs to go overseas, or he's a Christian, he needs to move out of this country. But he was, a, he was an apostate. He, he rejected Islam. There's nothing worse than that. Okay? So even in the Constitution, again, under American occupation, that was written, it was written with a big opening for Islamic law to dominate that country, for that religion for the Sharia to dominate that country. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about Europe. You know, you, we'll talk more about Europe uh, in the last class. Uh, let me just mention uh, one case um, in Turkey. I don't know if, uh, again, if you read just about a, I think it was a month ago, um, 
This lawyer walked into uh, the, uh, the, the equivalent of uh, kind of a, a, a federal court room, <coughs> secular courtroom. Um, this lawyer walked in with a gun, shouted Allah Akbar, and shot four judges, uh, killing one of them, uh, because they had ruled. They had followed the secular constitution of Turkey and ruled uh, against the teacher who wanted to wear religious garb while teaching, and that's outlawed by Turkey. And put aside whether that makes any sense or not as a law. But he felt, you know, he, he walked in and killed the guy for ruling on a, on a law because it enforced the secularism of, uh, of Turkish, you know. And, and there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of sympathy for this guy, and indeed a lot of people accused the new prime minister of Turkey for inciting this, not for directly ordering this, but for kind of the rhetoric that he's engaged in. And we will see, we'll talk a little bit about Turkey and the fact that the new prime minister of Turkey is a, an Islamist. He's kind of a, a moderate, kind of hiding a little bit. But his political party is dedicated, ultimately, long term, to the same thing. Islamic law, Sharia, in the most secular country other than Israel in the entire Middle East, and that is Turkey. And finally, a country we'll be talking a lot about, because in my view, uh, the country at the core, at the heart of the entire Islamic totalitarian movement, uh, the country where this movement got its start, and, and I think the pivotal country in the entire Middle East, and that is Egypt. Egypt. Not Saudi Arabia, not Iran, but Egypt. Uh, Egypt just had elections a few months ago. Um, the organization that we're going to be talking about a lot in this course, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which again, in my view, is the fountainhead of the entire Islamic fundamentalist movement, uh, with you know, some exception in Iran, but, but is, the, is the real source of much of the ideology that drives anybody from Khomeini to Bin Laden. Um, they are a legitimate political party in Egypt. They did so well in the elections that Mubarak, the president, actually sent troops up to block voting in certain regions so as to limit the number of representatives they have in the Egyptian parliament. But they have today more representatives than ever in their history and fewer than if you actually held open elections. They would, they would have got a lot more if you'd actually held open elections uh, in Egypt. So there's no question in my mind that in the Middle East, in Europe, uh, the Islamic totalitarian movement, the movement dedicated, and I'll, I'll define Islamic totalitarianism at this point, as a movement dedicated to the establishment of Islamic law, of the Sharia, by force or by peaceful, so-called peaceful means, right? We'll, we'll, we'll get in peacefully, but once we get in, Islamic law does not allow Democracy doesn't allow for elections. Uh, Islamic law uh, has no concept of individual rights. Islamic law dictates the exact behavior of everybody, uh, dictates all the way to the way women need to dress in public. So this movement dedicated to the, to the establishment of Islamic law is on the rise, is growing, is gaining in political power. Significantly. Okay. And what we're going to try and do in this class is find the historical origins of this movement and try to explain the revolution and try to explain why they are in the position that they're in today. Okay. Questions? Too early, huh? Now, there have been a number of attempts to explain uh, what's going on. I'm just going to briefly uh, go through a few of them. Um, oh, by the way, turn off cell phones. They're the standard explanations. You know, it's all, this is just a delayed response to Western colonialism. You know, they still remember that uh, the colonialists are the bad guys, the West are the bad, and this is, this is their response to it. They're still thrashing out against colonialism. And it's all our fault, ultimately, because we were the colonialists. Of course, the U.S. has never really been a colonial power. 
uh, in the Middle East. But, you know, we, we help their dictators. We, we're over there. And this is just a backlash to that. Okay. It's a backlash against modernity, against the Western values, against Western ideas. This is just a response, uh, a self-defense mechanism for them against everything that we represent, because we know everything we represent is so bad, particularly for them. Right? Uh, you know, it's a, um, it's a fantasy ideology. It's just like communism and fascism. They have this utopian ideal. You know, no, nobody really explains why they're so attracted by this utopia, but, you know, it's, they've learned it. I've read a number of books that say, this has nothing to do with particularly Middle East culture. They've really learned this from Europeans. You know, it's just, the, you know, they've read a lot of uh, uh, the same philosophers that motivated the, uh, you know, the West. And, and they show that, which is true, that most of the leaders of the Islamic totalitarian movements are very well educated in Western ideas. So this is just one more totalitarian movement in a string of totalitarian movements. Uh, and of course, nobody out there you know, really has a solid explanation of why Nazism rose or why communism rose. So this is just another one of these phenomena that just arise uh, out, of, uh, you know, out of these bad ideas, out of a need of some people to form these utopian concepts and strive towards them. Poverty, right? The poor. Maybe the poorest region in the world other than maybe Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, and this is poverty, just speaking out. This is a typical Marxist reason, right? It's all about economics. The poor, they're lashing out against the West. And, you know, again, that completely denies the empirical evidence which suggests that most suicide bombers in the Middle East are from middle class families. Uh, most of the leaders and the, you know, the, the officers, if you will, in uh, the Islamic totalitarian movement are middle class to upper class. Bin Laden, of course, is a multimillionaire. Uh, Zwahiri, his number two, is a, uh, is a physician, you know, well-trained, middle class. As we'll see, uh, most of the intellectual leaders of the movement come from uh, well-educated uh, teachers, uh, you know, these are not, this is not a movement of the proletarian. But, of course, the Marxists can only view it in those kind of concepts, in those kind of terms, in economic struggle terms. Okay. And finally, of course, it's uh, oppressive Arab regimes, you know, which we support. Uh, these are just oppressed people, and when you're oppressed... This is their only outlet. Their only outlet is this radical form of Islam. Okay. Uh, they have no, uh, of course, they couldn't advocate for real freedom. They couldn't advocate for real individual rights. Uh, you know, it's, this is it. And, and um, given that they want to get rid of their dictators, which is a goal we should all support, right, because they're dictators, um, this is probably a good thing, and if we just let it kind of play out, they will moderate over time. I mean, think of Hamas's victory, right? Hamas won against the dictator, the Palestinian Authority, corrupt, decadent, you know, billions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts, po incredible poverty in the Palestinian Authority, and supposedly the Hamas won because they are honest, more efficient, and they're going to take care of their people better. And really, as a backlash against these authoritarian regimes. And nothing to do with the specific Hamas ideology, we are told. And once Hamas gets into power, they will moderate their views. They'll come to recognize Israel. They'll, uh, they'll uh, you know, come to love the West. They'll become more open politically. You know, so, you know, we are told that all this uh, will happen. Again, I think a complete lack of understanding of what Hamas really represents, what the ideology is, and, and why people elected them, what motivated that election. But that's how it's, it's presented. So in all of, these, uh, all of these cases, I think, you know, many of them are just shallow. 
Many of them just, you know, they just don't even read the sources, you know, what, what these people write. They don't take ideas seriously, because if they took ideas seriously, they could never come up with these theories. If you actually read the ideas that motivate bin Laden, that motivate Hamas, that motivate the Hezbollah and, and the, you know, the, the people rioting uh, against the Danish cartoons, if you read the ideas that drive them, then none of these explanations would, would stand. Uh, none of these would be taken seriously. If you take ideas seriously, and of course we know that most of the commentators out there do not. So what we're going to try and do is look at the history, look at where, where these movements came from, and look at the ideas and how those ideas have evolved. The, the ideas at the, at the start were not the same uh, exactly, in application in particular, as the ideas at the very origins of these particular movements. Um, I'll also be, uh, you know, it'll just slip out, I'm sure, but I'll, I'll be using a number of different terms to, to identify these groups. Uh, Islamic totalitarianism, totalitarian Islam, uh, radical Islam, Islamism. It, you know, it'll come out, um, you know, I once in a while might say militant Islam. You know, in all of these cases, I mean those Muslims, those Muslim organizations, those Muslims' ideas, advocating for the establishment of Islamic law. And we'll talk about what region they intend, whether it's you know, their particular country, the whole Middle East, and ultimately the world. And, and almost all these ideologies would advocate ultimately the world. And they, you know, they start in different places in terms of what their particular goals are at a particular point in time. But all of them, the ultimate goal is Muslim rule over the entire world, Muslim law, dictating every aspect of our life over the entire world. Okay? Questions, comments? Yeah? You're talking about radical or militant Islam. Do you believe there is such a thing as moderate Islam at all? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I actually skipped one. Uh, you know, one explanation for all this is it's Islam. You know, it's just Islam. It's just a religion. You know, this is what happens. Uh, yeah, I should have repeated the question. Do I, uh, do I think that there's such a thing as moderate Islam? Yes, in this sense. Just like with any religion, you can interpret it in millions of different ways. There's no one way to interpret any religion. Um, and there are forces, like for example, that have moderated, if you will, Christianity. Reason. <laughs> right? Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle... Reason has moderated Christianity. There are definitely forces that are, have been applied to certain parts of the Islamic population that have moderated Islam. This is the, the, and there are Muslims who don't agree with this ideology. There are clearly Muslims who are not suicide bombers. There are Muslims, indeed, who are against them, who fight them. There are uh, you know, there are Muslims who take their religion more seriously and less seriously. Uh, just like there are Christians who take their religion more seriously and less seriously, but generally Christianity has moderated itself over the last thousand years to the point where they are not, you know, they're not after an inquisition. Now, granted, if they get political power, all bets are off. Uh, and you get a separation of church and state, all bets are off. But at least there are Christians out there who don't hold the same ideas that they held during the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. The same is true among Muslims. Not every Muslim advocates for this type of ideology. Now, I believe that it is a growing movement. I believe that in essential terms, in the core of the ideology, something like 20 plus percent probably of the Muslims around the world believe in this, maybe more. And more of those are open to these ideas. That is, if this gains political power, if this grows, then you could see a much larger percentage of the Muslim population being drawn into this. So I think many Muslims are open to this because their religion, you know, religion plays a huge role here. The religion, you know, the religion is at the core of it. The religion makes that possible. But uh, there definitely is such a thing as a Muslim who doesn't advocate for, for this type of, uh, of ideology. 
who's so much hair for a newborn. We need to start planning his baptism and his holiday outfit and, ooh, his birthday party. Sure, but um, how long are you planning to stay? If you're one of those who goes to meet your newborn nephew and stays until his first birthday party, switch to Cricket Wireless. Use your phone as many days as you want in Mexico without extra cost. Smile. You're on Cricket. Requires eligible plan. Minimum $55 per month. Data speed usage and other restrictions apply. Coverage not available everywhere. See store for details. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time in areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credit. It's over 30 months, starting within three bills. If cancel service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, taxes, and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Yeah. Are there Muslims who advocate against the establishment of Sharia law? Absolutely. There are absolutely Muslims who advocate. Muslims who believe in the Quran, you know, the, the, the believe in that religion, who actively advocate against the imposition of Sharia law, that actually advocate for the separation of church and state. Uh, Anywhere from, um, you know, the fact is that the, the ruling regime in Egypt, and, and I would still argue, I don't know what percentage of the population, but a significant percentage of the Egyptian population does not want Sharia law imposed on. Uh, I think that the number of those people is shrinking. The number of people who do want Sharia law, do want Islamic law, is, is rising. But uh, there's definitely still probably a majority in Egypt that would vote against Sharia law if that was put up. Okay? Uh, even in the Palestinian Authority, for a long time, I think that's, that's changed, but for a long time, a majority, a, a big majority, a huge majority, were against the imposition of Islamic law. This is a recent phenomenon among Palestinians, this, this radical Islamic thought. How do you spell Sharia law? S-H-R-I-A. A-R-I-A, sorry. Okay, history. In my view, as I've said, the key movement in the Islamic totalitarian movement, the key organization uh, is the Islamic Brotherhood. If you look at Osama bin Laden, he teaches at school, at a university in uh, Saudi Arabia, were Muslim brothers. If you look at Hamas, Hamas is a movement that explicitly evolved from the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. Even the Iranian regime, in the 1950s, when Khomeini, and, and even more radical elements uh, within Iran in the 1950s were committing terrorist attacks against the regime, assassinations. They were in close contact with the Muslim Brotherhood, were clearly reading the literature coming out of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and were inspired by it. Everyone, uh, you know, the Algerian Civil War, I don't know how many of you know about this, but well over 100,000 people died during the Algerian Civil War, brutal massacres. Uh, inspired again by this conflict between a secular regime and, and uh, these uh, Islamic radicals, were inspired, were members of the Muslim Brotherhood. So we're going to start by looking at this one organization. An organization was started, the Muslim Brotherhood as an organization was started in 1928 in a city called, a town called Ismailia in Egypt on the Suez Canal. And it was started by a man named Hassan El-Bana. Bana, B-A-N-A. Hassan El-Bana. Who was a school teacher in Ismailia. It is said that uh, a number of people came to his home one day, said, Hassan, we don't know anything. We're nothings. You obviously know the true path to God, to the truth, to the right way of bringing about change in this horrific country, in this country that is married by poverty. We give you our livelihood. 
We give you our money, our minds, our passion, everything. Please lead us in this struggle to change the world, to bring about Islamic and Islamic culture in Egypt. And, you know, Hassan couldn't resist. And uh, he declared that the name of the organization be the Islamic Brotherhood because they were all brothers. They were all motivated by the same ideas. They were all brothers in religion. Uh, they were all motivated by Islam, by, by the, 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 the rule of Islam, by the laws of Islam. Now, Bana was born in 1906, small village outside of Cairo, uh, born to a um, middle class kind of clay. His father was a scholar, was an Islamic scholar, was a preacher in the local mosque, wrote some books about interpreting the Quran and interpreting some of the, uh, you know, the, the Muslims have the Quran and then they have the Sunnah, which is the kind of the, the sayings uh, of, of Muhammad, uh, uh, which, which were written after his death, uh, and, you know, which is considered law, which is considered a guide to action, guides to behavior. Uh, his father was a scholar, would write about these things. He was educated, his father, at the, uh, at the premier university in the Muslim world, uh, the Al-Azhar uh, University in Cairo. Al-Azhar will, you know, is the establishment. That is the Muslim establishment. That is the, uh, that is the, so-called, we'll see how moderate they really are, but the so-called moderates today, you know, the ones who cooperate with the regime, with the, with the, with the government as it exists today, is in El Azam. Hassan was very well educated. Um, you know, he uh, learned the Quran by heart at a very young age. Uh, by the age of 12, he was involved in uh, a variety of different Islamic organizations, uh, in, um, in, his, uh, in his town, his local, in a small village. Uh, one of these groups that he was the secretary of at the age of 13 would send letters uh, to people who engaged in un-Islamic behavior, threatening them with sanctions if they didn't change the way they behaved. You know, if, if they were uh, dressed to uh, immodestly, uh, or if they listened to music, uh, or if they did anything that this particular group felt was inappropriate, uh, they, would, they would present them with, uh, with threats. Uh, he was, again, very well read in Islamic thought, in Islamic mysticism. Um, about the same time, um, this is the early, early 20th century, uh, Britain was occupying uh, Egypt. There were British forces, partially to protect uh, the Suez Canal, partially because there had been basically anarchy in that part of the world. Um, and, uh, and Hassan, uh, this is after, after World War I, Hassan developed, as did much of Egyptian culture, developed a real hatred of the British. Now, the British had been in Egypt for a long time. Uh, the British have had already a substantial impact on, on uh, Egyptian culture. Um, and there was definitely a, a rise in anti-British sentiment, particularly after World War I, trying to get them out. A rise in Egyptian nationalism, which had always been around. We'll talk more about nationalism uh, in a little while. Uh, Hassan was very anti-British from a very young age. Uh, British troops were stationed outside of the village. I mean, if, if the people within the village were behaving immodestly, just imagine how uh, an Islamic, uh, somebody completely... Uh, completely fundamentally religious, uh, completely obsessed with religion, would view the behavior of British soldiers. Okay. So he viewed them as this, and, and, and these were, these were uh, infidels in Islamic land, occupying an Islamic country. This was, just, this was just a reminder of the fact that Egypt was a failed country, was unsuccessful, a reminder of the failure of his own religion, which really you know, bothered him, obviously, and bothered many others. Uh, probably his strongest influence when he was young was a philosopher, an Islamic philosopher from the 12th century. Uh, if you've taken my uh, course on the history of the Middle East, which I recommend, <laughs> as, a, as a, you know, as a, together with this course, um, 
Yeah, Al Ghazali is the name of this philosopher. And this is the philosopher that destroyed, in my view, destroyed uh, the remnants of uh, Aristotelian thought, of Greek thought generally, in the Muslim world. Al Ghazali. Um, A L slash G H A Z Z A L I. And his dates are 1058 to 1111. At the time that he was teaching, Baghdad was a thriving city. Libraries, uh, Greek works being translated left and right, Com competition between the wealthy and who could have the best Greek library in the city. Uh, Aristotle, Plato, the Neoplatonics being taught all across the schools in Damascus and in Baghdad. Al Ghazali was a teacher. One day, you know, and, and the Muslims, just like the Christians, struggled in those days with how do you combine Aristotle, logic, reason, and faith? How do you, how do you mesh them together? And oh, if you read their philosophy, it's, you know, most of it is about how do, we, how do we get reason and faith to work together, right? Um, and Al-Ghazali, in my view, the pivotal, the pivotal, the greatest mind, I guess, of that era, goes away at some point after being one of these scholars who's trying to do this, who's teaching, goes away into the desert, disappears for a few years, and comes back and says, I found a solution. I found a solution to struggle between, you know, this inability of ours to combine reason and faith. And the solution is we have to drop reason. Real truth, real truth comes from revelation. Real truth comes from faith, comes from the abandonment of reason. Truth is all about faith. We need to go back to the origins of our Muslim faith, back to the Quran. And I, within 50 years, I mean literally that fast, Baghdad, the libraries have disappeared, the books are being burnt, it's gone. That whole civilization in that part of the world is gone. You know, within a few decades after that, the Mongols have sacked Baghdad. You know, usually people attribute the decline of Baghdad to the fact that the Mongols sack it. But the fact is that it was, it was a shell of itself by that point. The only remnants of this, you know, Islamic civilization is now in Spain, you know, and of course that gets uh, sacked by the Christians later on. But El Ghazali is that guy who says, reject reason. That philosopher who just destroys whatever civilization, and there was a real civilization in the Muslim world, particularly in the Fertile Crescent, the area between, you know, what is Israel today, Damascus and Baghdad and down to Basra. That area was thriving culturally during that period. This was his hero as he was growing up. Now, what was Egypt liked, like during this period? Um, and, and particularly, uh, Albana, when he's about 16, goes to Cairo to further his studies. And what's, what's Cairo like? Egypt is a poor country. It still is. It's a very poor country. If you, particularly if you go out of the cities. I mean, the cities are pretty poor. But if you go out into the cities, um, devastatingly poor. Uh, in spite of the fact that it is an incredible fertile country. You know, the whole region along the Niles is some of the most fertile land anywhere. Um, it is today a country of somewhere between, I think, 40 and 50 million people. Um, it, it is, uh, it, but it's a country of adjunct poverty. Uh, it is also, at the same time, during the 1920s, it is a country in political unrest. Lots of conflict. What's going on in the 1920s is this rise in Egyptian nationalism. This rise in the identity qua Egyptians. And indeed, a rejection of religion. A rejection of Islam. Strong Western influences. You have demonstrations in the streets between the liberals, in, in the positive sense, right? The liberals, pro-freedom, you know, some semblance of individualism. And the fascists. This is the 1920s. Brown shirts. Very much influenced by Mussolini, 
uh, later on into the 30s by the Nazi party. Huge demonstrations. These are the forces. And of course the third group, a smaller group, but a substantial nevertheless, are the communists. Socialism and communism are big in Cairo. Again, not, not in outskirts, not in the little villages. Big demonstrations, a lot of social upheaval, uh, and, and much, uh, quite a bit of rejection of tradition and Islam. Okay. According to Fahoud Ajami, who is a, who is a um, Lebanese scholar who lives in the United States, uh, during the 1920s, 1930s, Arab nationalism had fallen under the spell of German theories of nationalism. The unity of the folk, the bonds of race, the entire baggage of German populism. This strain of nationalism found particularly fertile soil in places like Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. So to these people, it was all about the Arab race. It wasn't about Islam. It was about being an Arab. And we will see how that plays out later on in Egyptian history. As, uh, again, Fouda Jami writes, um, for every admirer of Locke, so on the liberal side, and liberal thought, there was someone on the other side of the divide who was thrilled by the example of Mussolini and his black shirts. Indeed, the cult of Il Duce drew on dissatisfaction with, you know, what was going on in Egypt at the time and with British colonialism. This was, they, they were struggling against the British and the, and the, and the you know, liberal model. Uh, and the idea was the British were the bad guys, kick them out. Mussolini was a hero because he had stood up to, to, to the West, in a sense. Um. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. I need to keep up with my teens this summer without sweating high cell phone bills. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. We have plans to fit all your family's needs starting at just 25 bucks on the nation's best 4G LTE network. I won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like arguing about curfew. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in L.A. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com. Welcome to the Total Wireless Store, where total confidence awaits. Our daughter's off to summer camp, and we're worried our network coverage won't reach her. Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. Our phones run on the nation's best 4G LTE network. It'll be like she never left. The nation's best network? I feel better already. Now you can focus on how you're spending your summer. Discover the Total Wireless Stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in Los Angeles. Refer to the latest terms and conditions of service at TotalWireless.com. In addition, during Cairo, in Cairo in these days, there's a lot of, uh, this is post-World War I, there's this political upheaval, but there's also a lot of uh, loosening up of old constraints, lots of nightclubs, uh, you know, there are a lot of British soldiers in town, a lot of prostitution, a lot of gambling going on, a lot of, you know, hedonism, elements of nihilism, there's just a, a, a letting loose, a, a going crazy, and of course, this is the... the the world in which this young Muslim fanatic walks in, right, and, and sees this. This is, this is the culture uh, that he is encountering. Uh, there's really a revolt against, uh, against religion, particularly in literary and social salons. And they start establishing in Cairo in the 1920s these literary and social salons where, where people get together, read books, talk about ideas. I mean, this is really, you know, putting aside the fascist element, the nationalist, this is a a little renaissance happening in Egypt. Uh, real authors writing really interesting books, uh, secular books, uh, real ideas being debated. This is probably the, the best time Egypt has ever had. More newspapers are published during the 1920s, more different types of newspapers in terms of free speech than at any time in Egyptian history. And this was, of course, shut down very quickly once the British left. Under British rule during this period, there was a flourishing of what we would consider culture, what Hassan al-Banna would consider complete decadence. And indeed, he writes of this period, No one but God knows how many nights we spent reviewing the state of the nation, agonizing the si analyzing the sickness, and thinking of possible remedies. So disturbed were we that we reached the point of tears. 
unquote. Now, um, Obama also came under the influence during this period of two um, significant forces uh, from the 19th century, two significant thinkers in the Muslim world in the 19th century. Uh, Muhammad Abdu, A-B-D-U, 1849 to 1906, and Rashid Rida, R-I-D-A, 1865 to 1935. Both, both of these were well-educated. Uh, both of them lived in Paris parts of their lives. Both of them struggling with this big question that was really the entire Muslim world during the 19th century was struggling. Where did we go wrong? We used to be the most dominant force in the world. The Muslim Empire at some point reached from Spain to India and beyond. The Ottoman Empire at some point was the mightiest military force on earth. And yet starting in the 1700s, I mean, the Ottomans reached Vienna. They had, they had circled Vienna. They were about to take Vienna, central Europe, the heart of Europe. They were considered for a long time the biggest threat that Europe faced. And yet, the defeat in Vienna was the beginning of a series of systematic defeats where they just get pushed back and back and back and back. And, and, and the big question is why? What happened? And uh, both... Abdu and, and Rita, you know, uh, thinking, you know, what's, what happened? And, and they are among the first to articulate the explanation. The problem is we're not, we weren't good enough Muslims. God has abandoned us. God has turned his back on us and given the power to the devil to teach us a lesson. And the West is the devil. And the only reason the West is successful is because... God is using them as a tool to punish us. And what we need, the Muslims need, is unity. We need to unite. We've been fragmented. We've been fighting with one another. And we need to unite around the one idea that makes us unique and the one idea that is the truth, and that is Islam. We need to bring back Islam. And they... And, and again, they were very, they wrote journals, they wrote articles, they ran a, they ran a, a, a monthly journal, uh, uh, Rita did, called Al-Manar, uh, M-A-N-A-R, uh, that was published in, um, in uh, Cairo, basically advocating for this return to Islam, a return to the principles of Islam, and, and even saying, look, in kind of democracy, there's a certain appeal to this idea and I'm, I'm using democracy. When I use democracy, I'm using it in the best possible, you know, interpretation. Uh, you know, there's an appeal to this, you know, getting, getting people's view of this. But they said, it's not going to work. What we need is a benevolent dictator. What we need is a strong man to unite us and to bring about this unity and to help us stand up to the West. And, and you know, they were moderates, if you will. They, they didn't advocate war with the West. They didn't advocate the, the Islam being a system that takes over the entire world. This was, you know, just to preserve what they viewed as the crumbling Muslim world. You know, too much Western influences. Uh, I, I think they were among the first to coin the kind of uh, idea of cultural imperialism. Right? This idea that one of the ways in which the West takes you over is not by military force, but through their culture through the ideas. We need to purify ourselves from all of that and return. Of course, you know, they were wearing suits and ties and running around Paris and having a good time while they were doing this, but they were looking as intellectuals to the Middle East and telling, you know, we need to return to our core values. This is what will save us. So this is, these are the ideas that are kind of in Bana's mind, when he becomes a school teacher, gets assigned by the Department of Education to Ismailia. And Ismailia is a town dominated by the British because it's on the Suez Canal. This is the headquarters of the Suez Canal Company, 
running the canal. This is where they have a lot of troops because they are protecting the canal. Uh, the Suez Canal is a major economic interest for Britain and for France. So if there was an element of westernization in Cairo, there was certainly one in Ismailia where from Bana's perspective, the British, the people who worked closely with the British, the, uh, lived in these big homes up on a hill overlooking the beautiful canal, and the workers were in the slums all around the Egyptians. The more religious elements of society were being suppressed and being exposed to all this infidel stuff that the British were bringing in uh, with them. As a consequence, he forms and launches the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 to change all this, to Islamize Egypt. As he says, we are the brothers. We are brothers in the service of Islam. Hence, we are the Muslim brothers. But we are there in the service of Islam. The purpose is to bring about Islamic law and Islamic culture in Egypt. The first priority, kick out the British. They're a bad influence. They're destroying this country. They're bringing their Western values and Western ideas into here. We've got to get rid of the British. And then, over time, we will take over the political entity that is Egypt. And that, of course, is just a short-term goal because ultimately what we really want, and they say this, is a Muslim empire over reaching out over all Muslim world. And ultimately, once that's established in the very, very, very long term, and they're, they're very realistic about you know, the kind of centuries this will take, it is our goal to Islamize the whole world. Now the beginnings are very modest. The first three years, he builds up the membership in Ismailia, um, goes out preaching. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, sanction of the victim. Uh, but uh, it's documented that uh, Hassan Ibana receives, uh, f in order to build, I think, some schools, they, they immediately start building schools and mosques and so on, uh, he receives a, a nice check from the Suez Canal Company, right? Uh, they applied for a grant, and, uh, and they received one, uh, to build, um, I, I think it was a mosque or, or a school for boys and girls. They branch out all over the area. By 1932, in 1932, Bana is transferred to Cairo. We establish as the first branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo. By 1939, this is 11 years later, the Muslim Brotherhood was, is one of the most important political entities in Egypt within 11 years. Membership in the Muslim Brotherhood represents every part of Egyptian society from the very wealthy, very well-educated, to the middle class, to the civil servants. Civil servants in this kind of society are an enormous number, all the way down to the poorest of the poor. In particular, the Muslim Brotherhood is strong among the middle class, the civil servant middle class, and among students. And they place from the beginning a strong emphasis on universities, on academia, <laughs> just like we do, right? <laughs> and they become, they become more and more active. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood hold regular lecture series you know, on a weekly basis at their headquarters and all in all their branches around the country. They use the network of mosques to go out and preach in these mosques. The, the, the local imams, the local mosque leaders, open these mosques up to them, allow them to preach there. Again, this is outside of the official authorized religious infrastructure. I mean, Bana was not trained in religion. He was not a graduate of Al-Azhar. That was his dad. There was, there was no, they were not part of the, kind of the more official imams and mosques, but they were allowed in. They were allowed in everywhere. In um, the mid-30s, they established something called the Rovers, or Rovers, R-O-V-E-R-S, or the Secret Apparatus. These are groups of young men trained 
in military tactics, trained with weapons. Originally, their role is to enforce the rules of the Muslim Brotherhood on the Muslim Brotherhood. We will see that later they are used to bring the Muslim Brotherhood's violent message to the rest of society. Now, during this period, during the 20s and 30s, British obviously still there. Um, Egypt is a monarchy during this time. You know, it's kind of a constitutional monarchy. There is a, there is a parliament that is elected. There is a prime minister who actually follows the, the, you know, the executes, is the executive branch. But the king really is kind of controlling things uh, from behind. In 1937, a new king, King Farouk, I think the second, is crowned. And indeed, as World War II is approaching, 1939, the British become more entrenched in Egypt. This is a key strategic location for them. So if in 1930, the Muslim Brotherhood had five branches, by 1940 they had 500. They had tens of thousands of active members. And it was a substantial political force. Let's look a little bit at some of the core ideas beyond this general abstraction of Islamic law. What, what, what were they about? What were they advocating for? Well, maybe one of the most important ideas shared by all Islamic totalitarian movement is this idea of the totality of Islam. Islam covers everything. Every aspect of life is dictated by Islam. To them, the notion of separation of church and state is just bizarre. If you've got this, these principles that God has given you, that are true, why would you say that a certain part of life is, should be ignored? The notion that, you know, give unto Caesar you know, what is Caesar's and give it to God, what is God's, is to them uh, an abomination. Everything is God's. Caesar is only Caesar because God allows him to be Caesar. He is just a spokesman for God. He is just a representative of God on earth. So what you give unto Caesar is what you would give unto God. It's just He's just an intermediary in a sense. Okay? He's just a representative. Islam to them is, the, is uh, formulated by the Quran and the Sunnah. And that's it. You know? There's very little room for interpretation. Most of that interpretation has already been done. Yeah, you have to modernize it because the new situations have come up. But all the truths, all the principles to do that have already been established. You don't need new ideas. The ideas are already in the Quran, in the Sunnah. It's done. The work has been done. God has spoken. Remember that Islam um, says the Jews were God's people. And they failed. They failed. So God had to bring about, you know, bring Jesus. And, and of course, the, the, they say Jesus being God's son, I mean, that's just ridiculous. If there's only one God, there's only one God. You can't have three gods. You can't have two gods. You can't have sons of gods. That's just bizarre. And I have a lot of sympathy for that view. Right? <laughs> Um, if you're going to believe in a God, then there's just one of them, right? Um, so God brought Jesus to kind of, you know, redeem the, Jew the Jews and to spread the ideas out into the rest of the world because the Jews don't spread their ideas. It's just for them. They're, they're special people, right? And then the Christians are the first monotheistic to, to actually advocate for, for spreading their religion. But they failed. They failed by creating this three entities. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They became polytheists. The Muslims call the Christians polytheists. So God had to come back and talk to Muhammad, who is the last of the prophets, to give him the final word. And, and the, the first saying every Muslim says is, there is one God and one God only. That is the thing they say, I don't know how many times a day, at least five when they do their prayers. 
There's one God because they're fighting the Christians by saying there is one God and there's one God only. You know, on, on, the, uh, on the mosque in Jerusalem, the uh, mosque that sits, um, you know, that there's the, the big fights on in Jerusalem, that sits on the place where supposedly the Jewish temple was, uh, right above the Wailing Wall. No accident that that mosque is right there. It is a political statement saying, this is the new, that is the old. Uh, this, is, this is the city that's a holy place for Jews and Christians. We are placing our most glorious mosque, most important mosque, right here to show you who ba- who's the boss right now. And on the mosque it says, it's engraved, something like, I don't have the exact quote, but something like, there is only one God. And, and that's a political statement to the Christians. You know, it's, it's all about, you know, stating that to Christianity. Shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, so Islam is this total system. covers everything. Uh, and, and it's all being already revealed. Uh, and they have the latest word. They have the latest word for God. They got the last transmission. It's gone silent since then. They have the truth. That's it. Okay. To them, Islam is a way of life an ideology, a religious group, a political organization. And, a th- in, in, in the Muslim Brotherhood is all those plus an as- athletic society, a cultural educational union, an economic company. They actually bought assets and ran companies that funded the Islamic Brotherhood's activity and a social idea. Bana writes to his followers, quote, you are a new soul in the heart of this nation to give it life by means of the Quran. You are a new light which shines to destroy the darkness of materialism through knowing God. And you are a strong voice which rises to recall the message of the Prophet. When asked what it is for, what it is, uh, what it is for which you call, reply that it is Islam, the message of Muhammad, the religion that contains within it government and has one of its obligations, freedom. We'll talk about what freedom means to them. If you are told that you are political, answer that Islam admits no such distinction. Of course, we're political. That's what Islam is. It would be bizarre otherwise. Hi, it's Jamie, Progressive's Employee of the Month, two months in a row. Leave a message at the... Hi, Jamie. It's me, Jamie. I just had a new idea for our song about the Name Your Price tool. So when it's like, tell us what you want to pay, hey, 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 and the trombone goes, blah, 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 and you say, we'll help you find coverage options to fit your budget. Then we just all do finger snaps while a choir goes, savings coming at ya, savings coming at ya. Yes? No? Maybe? Anyway, see your practice tonight. I got new lyrics for the rap break. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Oh, what a great audience. Let's dim the lights for this next one. Oh, too much. Ah, there it is. Gotta get things just right. Like Progressive's Name Your Price tool. Tell us what you want to pay and we help you find coverage options that fit your budget. And now, the mood is right. Wait, the lights are back on again. Trudy, can you... And now it's completely dark. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Now, the 1930s are also um, their first venture outside of Egypt. The, the, outside of Egypt, the Islamist, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's first ventures out. Their first contact outside of uh, Egypt is with um, the Palestinian Mufti, the leader of the Palestinian people at the time. Uh, Amin al Hussein, Haji Amin al Hussein, Husseini. Uh, al Husseini uh, was uh, an explicitly pro Nazi uh, leader of the Palestinians. He was uh, kicked out of Palestine a number of times by the British. Uh, he is indeed, uh, there are photographs of him meeting in Germany with uh, Goebbels in a Nazi uniform. Um, and uh, he, was, uh, he was kind of their first contact. Of, um, with, with, of the Muslim Brotherhoods outside of Egypt, and he met with uh, Hassan al-Banna's brother in Palestine in 1935. And indeed, by, uh, in that year, they formed the first cell, or the first organization in Palestine, 
Uh, it grew dramatically over the following years into the 1940s. Um, the first uh, office in Jerusalem was in 1945. Uh, by the time of uh, the War of Independence in Israel, there were well over uh, 50 offices with 25,000 members of the Muslim Brotherhoods in Palestine. You know, these are Palestinian Muslim Brotherhoods, and we'll see that that is the foundation, that is the core, that is explicitly where the Hamas comes from. The founder of the Hamas was the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza, in the West Bank. Uh, from there, the Muslim Brotherhoods uh, spread into Jordan, and they are indeed today a substantial political force within Jordan. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, during this period, um, particularly as we get into 1947, 48, uh, raised a lot of money uh, to try and defeat uh, the Israelis, the Jews, uh, during the war between the Pal first war between the Palestinians and the Jews. And indeed, the Muslim brothers in Egypt will send troops, will send armed men to fight on the side of the Palestinians during the conflict in 1948. And they are known, at least uh, from my days when I studied uh, the history, I haven't found any reference to this in any of the history books, but we were taught that they were the fiercest of all, fiercest of all the fighters. You know, because you got a bunch of Egyptians, right, in the Egyptian army who have no idea probably where Palestine is even. I mean, they're, they're farm kids from poor families on the Nile fighting in a distant land. They're, they're not motivated. But these Muslim brothers who volunteered to go there were committed to kicking out the infidel from Muslim land, as I think Hamas still is committed to kicking out the, Mus the, the infidel from Muslim land. And they were passionate about this. They were motivated. This was not, they weren't forced into this. This was something they volunteered to do. Okay. World War II. It's a little bit about World War II. Uh, during World War II, uh, again, the British influence is significant in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, a lot of sympathy for the Nazis. A lot of sympathy for the Nazis among the Egyptian people, particularly among the more educated Cairo uh, nationalists. Anwar Sadat, who would later become president of Egypt, is arrested in 1942 for contact with the Nazis. Um, the, the many, and this is in the military. He was an officer in the military. So many in the Egyptian military uh, talking with the Nazis, uh, uh, aligned with them and would actually like to see a Nazi victory in North Africa. There's heavy Brit British pressure on the king and government to crack down on the opposition. Uh, the Egyptian government officially stays neutral during the war. And indeed in 1945, you know, weeks or months before the war was to come to an end, uh, the, uh, the Egyptian prime minister, in a speech in front of parliament, is stating that they have taken sides, right? That they're going to be there with the Allies, with the British, and he gets shot in the middle of the speech. He gets assassinated in the middle of that speech. So, you know, they come around at the end of the war, and of course there's, there's significant forces that are rejecting uh, this idea within Egyptian society. And communism is growing dramatically. Because communism is viewed... They're not quite the Allies, right? They're not the British. They're anti-British. They're anti-the West. And they're not the Nazis. They're the good guys. Right? So communism grows dramatically during this period. And indeed, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood comes to view communism as a major, major enemy. Communism is explicitly atheist. Uh, and as a rising force where the Muslim Brotherhood want to have an impact, which is on the universities. Universities is where there's a communist hotbed like it, like it was everywhere. I think during the 1940s, uh, the Muslim Brotherhoods view them as, a, as competition. So the Brotherhood opposes the British. They advocate for getting rid of them. They agitate against them. They want an Egyptian revolution. There's pressure building within the organization, not at the leadership, within, for armed resistance. 
kick the British out, take over the, 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 uh, the uh, Egyptian government by force. Uh, indeed, many of the more radical members who want military action leave. Hassan and Banna resists. It's not the time, he tells them. He tells them there will be a time. There will be a time. Well, you will you know, command me to lead the battalions into parliament, and we will take over. But it is not yet. We are too weak. We will lose if we do it now. Uh, he resists all calls for militarization at this point, but he, he doesn't reject the notion. Um, during the 1940s, there continuously clashes with the government. Bana is arrested. Other members are arrested, released, arrested, released. This is a pattern that the Egyptian government follows regularly. They round them all up. They try them. They hang a few of them. They release the rest. They land up having to arrest them a few years later, hang a few, release them. Uh, if you follow Egyptian news today, it's still going on. The same kind of pattern. Um, in 1943, uh, they, in, in the mid-1940s, uh, an explicit concept of jihad, of, of, of fighting, of using violence is adopted by the organization, officially, as, as, as something that's okay. We're not going to do it yet, but it's now officially part of what we're going to do, this, this idea of, of, an, of an aggressive jihad. What's interesting is during this period, they also start organizing on a communist model. They've, they've studied Lenin. Um, and they create cells of no more than five members uh, where who knows whom is very much controlled, particularly within the secret apparatus. You know, they are organizing clearly for revolution. Small cells, they add in new members. As they add in new members, they splinter off into another cell uh, if you look at the way uh, much of Al-Qaeda is organized today, much of the Islamic totalitarian movement is organized today, they've learned the lessons of history and how to organize in a way as to disrupt the organization. If, if particular people are identified, the organization as a whole suffers little because you're just cutting off a few leaves. You're not, there's, no, there's no trunk. They don't have this orga central organizational infrastructure that you can just destroy in one fell swoop. Okay. It's all splinted, all arranged through these cells. As I said, uh, the Egyptian prime minister is assassinated in 45. The Muslim Brotherhood is accused of it originally. It turns out there wasn't them. It was uh, a nationalist, but they were all rounded up and arrested and then released again. Um, after the war... Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood become increasingly aggressive. They are increasingly popular within uh, Islamic, the, the, the Egyptian society. At their peak in 1949, they have 2,000 branches. They have active membership of half a million. Half a million active members. They have at least a million sympathizers. You know, that, that are committed to the cause. And they be start becoming more and more aggressive. Universities continue to be a strong emphasis. The influence increases. And indeed, between 45 and 48, violence on the part of Muslim brothers increases. Assassination attempts, bombing of governments and British buildings, killing of British troops. A judge who sentences a Muslim brotherhood to jail is assassinated. Okay. Now, Elbana would claim that he knew nothing of all this. This is just splinter groups and cells acting on their own. But there is substantial evidence that he was at least gave the nod, gave authorization to a lot of this. He felt strong. He felt powerful. In 1948, as a consequence, in the midst of the war in Palestine, um, the Egyptian government disbands the Muslim Brotherhood, makes it illegal, and indeed, the troops in Palestine, the Muslim brothers fighting over there, are uh, surrounded by Egyptian troops, uh, required to hand in their weapons, and are told, you can either go home, or you have to fight under Egyptian command as Egyptian soldiers, as regular soldiers. Many stay, most go back to Egypt. We'll see that 
the attitude of the Muslim Brothers towards war in, uh, with the Israelis changes later on. In 1948, there's a uh, Islamic, kind of an Islamic revolution in Yemen, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood clearly supports that. That is viewed as a, against Egyptian interests. Uh, Egypt continues to clamp down uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood, claiming that they are planning uh, a revolution in Egypt. While in prison, there are 4,000 Muslim brothers in prison. They continue organizing. They continue studying together. And they continue operating. Uh, outside of Egypt, by 1950, the Gaza Strip is now part of Jordan. The, uh, not the Gaza Strip. The West Bank is part of Jordan. The Muslim brothers in the West Bank and the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood combine. The Gaza Muslim Brotherhood, which is not part of Egypt, have the alliance to the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, who, of course, are illegal and still in jail. What's interesting is, this, this organization is so popular, they are so prevalent within, and so much political pressure to resurrect them, that by 1951, the Egyptian government basically reconciles themselves with the Muslim Brotherhoods, creates, you know, says, it's legal again, you can frees everybody from jail, and the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, is reestablished as a substantial political force uh, within Egyptian society. At this, um, now, uh, two years earlier, uh, and I think one of the reasons the Egyptian government feels comfortable in doing this, two years earlier, in 1949, uh, on his way, um, Albana was never arrested, so all the other members were arrested, Albana was still out. And on his way to work one day, Albana is assassinated in 1949. Um, every indication is that the government was behind it in spite of all the denials, and later on uh, there were indeed trials, and, and a number of people were, 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 pros were prosecuted for the assassination of Albana. But uh, I, think, I think all the evidence points to the fact that the government was basically uh, involved, the funeral was uh, surrounded by tanks, the funeral procession surrounded by tanks so that only a few people could attend. It was very controlled. Uh, the Egyptian government really feared this man and feared the organization that he had created. When he was gone um, and, and the Muslim Brotherhood was reconstituted, uh, they chose as a new leader uh, what was considered a moderate at the time, a former judge. And, and another example, here's a judge who used to be secular, Obviously well-educated, he was a secular judge, not a, not a re religious authority at all, uh, who had been converted to the Muslim Brotherhood by Bana. He had seen Bana, been inspired by him, uh, realized his, you know, that his, uh, his life was wasted, that Islam was the true light, and became part of his leadership and became indeed the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1951. Let's go th through the next chapter. 1952, uh, Egypt goes through a revolution. A small group of officers led by, uh, ultimately, G by Gamal Abdul Nasser. Sadat is this kind of number two, number three guy. Th overthrow the Egyptian monarchy. Uh, this is a group of committed nationalists. Uh, much of their agenda is about getting rid of the British. And Nasser has a, a bigger vision. And indeed, Nasser becomes, for about a decade, he becomes the, a real hero of the Arab world. Uh, a real, a almost mythical figure uh, within the Arab world. Um, he is the guy who's going to unite all the Arabs. Not the Muslims, all the Arabs. This is about nationalism. It's about the Arab race. He's an incredible speaker, um, motivator. He's also a committed socialist, social nationalism. Um, nationalizes much of the Egyptian economy during the 1950s, of course, with the, 
with the obvious consequences. Uh, but when they first come to power, these uh, free offices, these, uh, these uh, nationalists, realize that they need as many allies as possible. And they look around. And the obvious ally for them are the Muslim Brothers. They have a wide popular base. They have students who can demonstrate at the universities. They have political clout. They have clout with the religious establishment. They are a vital element for these free officers to, to engage in their revolution. And the Muslim Brothers have a long history of being anti-British. And much of what these free officers are about is about kicking out the British from Egypt. And indeed, the Muslim Brothers jump on board. They think this is wonderful, and they meet, they've been meeting with Sadat for years. Sadat assures them that their intentions is to establish a Muslim country, that, uh, that they're going to bring in Sharia, they're going to bring in Islamic law, that they're really good Muslims, that the nationalism is just, you know, it's just, uh, uh, you know, just words. They're not really committed to that. They're really committed to, to an Islamic agenda. And the Muslim brothers buy into that completely. They are substantial force holding up this revolution when it happens. Of course, within about two years, you know, the uh, Nasser's forces, as they become stronger, as they become more entrenched, slowly start brushing off the Muslim brothers, slowly distancing themselves. Of course, they refuse. They refuse to impose Islamic law. Uh, and the Muslim brothers become more and more disenchanted uh, with them. And as these Nasser and his people become stronger, the Muslim Brotherhood weaker, uh, for, uh, they become more emboldened in attacking the Muslim Brotherhood. So, so very early on, they uh, dissolve all political parties in Egypt, except for the Muslim Brotherhood. They keep the Muslim Brothers, they're the only organization that's allowed to be independent of this new regime. But within a couple of years, by 1954, the Muslim Brothers are deemed uh, an illegal organization. Indeed, the impetus for this is uh, an attempted assassination on Nasser um, by a Muslim brother who shoots at him, misses. Uh, Nasser turns this into a huge propaganda deal. He, he actually, he, he makes this into this heroic act. He survived the assassination. He, this is in um, uh, north of Cairo. He has this whole procession where he goes from there into Cairo. And of course, the masses are out roaring. He's come back in spite of this attempt. He survived. And his popularity increases dramatically. He's now in a position to arrest the entire Muslim Brotherhood leadership. Uh, in 1956, six of the members are hung and hundreds are sent to jail. And indeed, if you read scholars writing about the Islamic revival in the Middle East, if you read them, books they were writing in the 1960s, even in the 1970s, they view 1954 to 1956 as the end of the Islamic revival. It's finished, it's done. With the collapse of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, with Nasser destroying them, the era of the Muslim Brothers is finished, the era of Arab nationalism is peaking. And this goes into the 1970s. And actually, if you read later editions of those books, in the intros, in the you know, forwards, they say, we thought, and look what happened. You know, we were wrong. We were wrong. They've, they've, you know, they've come back. But in the 1970s, looking back, they were finished. They were dead. They were all in jail, all the, the leaders. The organization structure was destroyed. Uh, the nationalists basically took over whatever mosque, school infrastructure, social work infrastructures they had created were taken over by the nationalists. Um, there was no real Islamic movement anywhere else in the Middle East, as far as these experts were looking, could see. Indeed, if you go to Iran during about the same period of time, uh, the, the Fadayin di Islamia, which were influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood who were committing assassinations and so on, were being crushed by the Shah over there. 
everywhere where they had risen just a little bit, these elements were being destroyed. So there was nothing. Um, so what happened right after um, this destruction is, is interesting. How did, they, how did they rise up from what at least the academics, the people, the historians who looked at it at the time would say was complete destruction and death? Um, and as we'll see, we'll talk about this uh, next time, um, a lot of it has to do with... Um, what, the, what, these Muslims, uh, what these Muslim brothers did in jail. They used their jail time effectively. Uh, indeed, one person in particular in Egypt, uh, a Muslim brother by the name of Said Qutb, uh, Q-U-T-B, was one of those jailed Muslim brothers that was placed in jail in 1954. He was relatively new to the Muslim Brotherhood, but joined just a few years earlier, was very well educated, but he had joined the Muslim Brotherhood at the age of 45. Very well educated. We'll, we'll talk more about kind of his background uh, tomorrow. But Said Qub spends his time writing in jail, writing books. Books that are probably the most well, uh, uh, most translated, uh, uh, most purchased books in the entire Muslim world. His commentaries on Islam in 30 volumes is supposed to be the best-selling book in the Muslim world since the 1950s. Still sells. If you go to any Arab country, or you go to London, in certain areas in London, you will find stalls, booksellers in the street selling books, and you will find Said Qurb is a you know, big chunk of the books that they're selling are books by Said Qurb. Uh, Said Good, in my view, is intellectually, ideologically, the real father of the radical, more militant, more violent brand of Islamic totalitarianism. Uh, Bin Laden, uh, the, the, the Algerians, all the violent movements, all, all attribute... They themselves attribute their origins to this man who spent the next, from 54 until he was uh, executed in 1966, basically writing for 12 years. That's all he did. Sat in jail, wrote books, and unleashed these violent, radical forces within the Muslim world. Gave them the ideological tools, weapons, to justify not only killing Americans, not only killing Jews, but killing Muslims. Killing Muslims. When you see these uh, bombs going off in, uh, in Iraq, or when you see uh, suicide bombers walking into uh, wedding ceremonies in Jordan, when you see uh, 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 resorts uh, where Egyptians go to in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh or in Dahab in the Sinai Peninsula being blown up and Egyptians, Muslims dying. When you see Sadat being assassinated, uh, where Egyptian leaders left, uh, 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 Muslim leaders attempted assassinations and Muslim leaders and, and, and Muslims generally being killed, it is Said Qurb who provided the justification for those killings. Um, the power of ideas, the power of books. Um, so, any, we've got like four minutes. Questions? Yeah, Betty. Why did they let his books out? Why did they let his books out? <laughs> I think they let his books out ultimately because they don't realize the impact of ideas. Uh, and it takes a while for, for, for that to, to get absorbed. So, his one book, his most influential book, uh, translated uh, signposts or uh, milestones, depending on how you translate it, uh, was banned originally. Uh, uh, Nasser actually supposedly read it, released it from being banned, and a year later was banned again. Uh, and of course, it was smuggled out of jail anyway. It was being read chapter by chapter by his uh, followers in, uh, in apartments and secret meetings all over Cairo. 
and was being distributed, photocopied and distributed throughout the Muslim world among these Muslim Brotherhood cells uh, all across, all across the, the Muslim world. And, and of course today, you know, in Europe, uh, all, all these books are out there. So, you know, censorship you know, doesn't work in the face of, uh, of an organization like this that is going to distribute these ideas one way or the other, underground, whether it's up front or underground, will distribute their ideas. Uh, secondly, you have to remember that all of these Arab dictators, and we'll talk about this next time, all of these Arab dictators, including Nasser, who claimed to be a secularist, who came, claimed to be westernizing Egypt, and you know, nationalist, and so on, all um, cozied up to Islam. All of them tried to get the sanction from religion. And this is, this is a key to... to, to Part of why this movement keeps growing, why it's never oppressed, because everybody, including the secularists, including the so-called people who stand up for the West, don't really. They, they use Islam for their own purposes, for their own means. Okay. So he can't. This is an Islamic book. He can't reject it. There was another question, yeah. Do you think they're more committed to killing or converting infidels of the rest of the world? Well, I think in the short run, they're more committed to... So are they more committed to killing or converting infidels to Islam? I think in the short run, they're committed to killing because, uh, because conversion is too difficult. Uh, you know, infidels are too far away, and it's too difficult. I think the long-run plan, and this is if you go back to Islamic history, how they took over the, the, the world as they knew it at the time, was through a lot of conversion. And they were very successful in conversion. Very, very successful. They're one of the few cultures I know of where the, the, uh, like the Mongols conquered them and then converted to Islam. When the Mongols conquered Europe, they didn't convert to, to Christianity. But they did convert to, to, to Islam. So they were very successful in converting uh, foreign, foreigners. Okay, qu- a real quick one. Yeah. Uh, how much influence does Plato or Neoplatonism have on, their, on Islam or their political arrangement? Um, I don't. I, I haven't found any uh, any uh, connection between the Muslim Brotherhood and Neoplatonism or Plato. There is definitely a connection between Ayatollah Khomeini and the Neoplatonists and Plato. Uh, there's no question that Khomeini read Plato, read the Neoplatonists, and if you read his political writings, if you le- if you read his writings about what an Islamic republic will look like, it is clearly modeled after a Platonic, you know, a Plato-type republic. And if you think about the philosopher king, well, isn't Khomeini views himself as a philosopher king because he is the wisest, the smartest. The, 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 uh, the, he called it the rule of ju- the judiciary, the rule of the Islamic, um, uh, the Islamic scholars. And, and that was the equivalent of the philosopher. And, of course, he positioned himself as, as king. Quickly, John, though. Just to point out that the Iranian government has a council of guardians. Yeah, same thing. Right from yeah. Plato. yeah, the structure of the Islamic government is very much out of Plato's Republic. So there's no question that Plato had an influence on, on, uh, on Khomeini. I haven't seen any influence on the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and Khomeini was influenced both by Plato, by Islamic Shiite thought, and clearly by Said Qutb, who he read, and by the Muslim Brotherhood. So there were a number of influence on, uh, on Khomeini. We'll get to him maybe tomorrow, probably the day after. Okay? Thank you all. See you tomorrow morning. This course continues with Lecture 2. I'm in Glendale and found love in the South Bay. Yes, I find myself in an L.A. long-distance thing. Guess who helped make it work? AT&T. I bought one phone, got another one on them. And romance is alive on the 101. Come into an AT&T store, buy a smartphone, and get one on us. More for your thing. That's our thing. Limited time and areas. Select devices. Each requires up to $900 on installment agreement. Requires one new line of minimum $75 per month service. Free after credits over 30 months, starting within three bills. If canceled service, device balance is due. $30 activation, additional fees, tax. Taxes and restrictions apply. See your local AT&T store for details. Welcome to the Total Wireless store, where total confidence awaits. I need a smartphone with an awesome camera. Got anything to fit a new dad's budget? Don't worry. You got this with Total Wireless. And now you can get $50 off on select phones $99 and up. My relatives won't miss a thing. Now you can focus on the important stuff, like diaper duty. Discover the Total Wireless stores and get total confidence. The latest phones, the best network, all at great prices. Now open in L.A. Limited time offer in 63018. Available while supplies last. Porting required for a non-track phone brand. Offer only available at Total Wireless stores. Visit store for details.
details. Little wireless stores visit store for 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 details.